Number 5. Tyran Dobbs In February 2015, Zachary Lee, a 23-year-old from Maryland in the US, contacted Robert Walker McDade from Coventry, England. Through a messaging app, Lee asked the latter's help in swatting another Maryland resident called Tyler Dobbs. McDade called a terrorist hotline while pretending he was Dobbs. He made claims about having hostages, explosives, and a loaded gun. He threatened to start killing people unless $15,000 was delivered to his address. In response to the false threats, a SWAT team raided Dobbs' home. They shot the 20-year-old in the face and chest with rubber bullets, resulting in broken facial bones and bruised lungs. Lee and McDade were subsequently arrested, facing charges of up to 20 years in prison. Coming up, a swatting incident is captured on live stream and it goes viral. But first, let's take a look at the origins of the term. Swatting is one person's action of deceiving an emergency service into sending a response team to another person's address. The swatter will typically lie to a dispatcher by claiming a serious emergency, such as murder, a hostage situation, or a bomb threat. The term itself is derived from the SWAT unit, meaning special weapons and tactics, which is a specialized branch of law enforcement that handles critical incidents in the US. It's a type of intervention unit that's present under various names in countries all over the world. Swatting started as an online prank, but soon became the means for enacting revenge among people feuding online. It's a highly dangerous practice that can get people hurt and even killed. Number 4. Jordan Mathewson Streamer Jordan Mathewson was already fairly well known in the gaming community before the infamous incident of August 2014. Mathewson was live streaming from his office when a SWAT team stormed in and ordered him to get on the ground at gunpoint. The whole scene was captured by his live stream and subsequently went viral. Mathewson was taken in for questioning and released shortly after. An unknown caller had contacted 911 and given the address of the man's office while claiming they'd shot two people and were holding others hostage. Our next case involves a man who, despite being blind, became a dangerous phone hacker from a young age. But before we get to that, let's find out how swatters can sometimes cover their tracks. Before we continue, official They Will Kill You merchandise is now available at theywillkillyou.com. Stop clowning around and check it out, because your purchases really help support the channel. Tracking down a swatter may be a difficult task. They can manipulate their caller ID data, disguise their voice or trick people into divulging confidential information. They can also use freaking techniques, meaning that they explore the weaknesses in telecommunication systems. 911 operators have been deceived by perpetrators placing calls from cities hundreds of miles away or even from other countries. The FBI first coined the term swatting in 2008. The practice is most common in the gaming community on live streaming platforms such as Twitch. Although the issue is more prevalent in the US, there have been reports of swatting from prank phone calls to more elaborate schemes in countries all over the world. There are even those who offer their services for a fee as a type of swatting mercenaries. A number of celebrities have also been swatted at their homes including Miley Cyrus, Tom Cruise, Justin Bieber or Snoop Dogg. Number 3. Matthew Weigman Even though he was born blind, Matthew Weigman developed a remarkable ability to imitate voices and memorize phone numbers by tone. Weigman could even understand how a phone network system worked by listening to various frequencies. When he was 11 years old, he discovered Party Lines, a loop telephone circuit. He would reportedly spend days on the telephone at a time, perfecting his skills. Unfortunately, Weigman didn't use his powers for good. He did his first swatting when he was 14 years old, on a girl who refused his advances during a party line session. He used a forged ID and called 911, pretending to be a gunman holding her and her father hostage. Prior to his arrest at age 18, he performed up to 60 more forget swat calls. He used his skills of freaking phones to listen in on conversations, find unlisted numbers or shut off clients' phone services. Towards the end of June 2009, Weigman was sentenced to 11 years and 3 months in a federal penitentiary. 
Next up, there's an incident that resulted in the nearly fatal shooting of a police chief. Before we learn about how he survived the ordeal, let's see how swatting can actually kill you. Many have described swatting as an act of terrorism, since it's used to intimidate and create the risk of injury or death. A SWAT team or its equivalent in another country typically shows up with military-grade equipment such as body armor, door breaching weapons, sniper rifles, automatic rifles, or submachine guns. The team is responding to what they believe is a high-risk situation, while the SWATing victims are blindsided by the intervention. It's a tense meeting of circumstances that may produce a fatal outcome. SWATing victims may fire first, believing they're actually the victims of a home invasion, thus triggering a shootout. The chances of a tragic outcome are increased when officers responding to the call come from less specialized branches of law enforcement. In a tense situation, any confused gesture may be mistakenly interpreted as an act of aggression. Even if nobody gets hurt physically, victims may suffer mental or emotional trauma following the intervention. Additionally, mobilizing law enforcement wastes resources which may be allocated towards a genuine emergency. Number 2. James Edward Holly in January 2015, dispatchers from the town of Sentinel, Oklahoma, received a 911 call from a man claiming he was Dallas Horton. He told them that he placed a bomb in the refrigerator of a local preschool, the Sentinel Head Start. It was supposedly set to go off just as the children were arriving for classes. The building was evacuated and checked by a bomb squad, but no explosive devices were found. Then, Sentinel Police Chief Lewis Ross and several other officers forced their way into Dallas Horton's home. The police chief was shot several times by Horton, who had no idea that the police were raiding his home. Ross was hit in the chest and arm. Fortunately, he was wearing a bulletproof vest and survived the shooting. It was later discovered that a man named James Edward Holly, who was angry with Horton, had made the call. Holly had somehow made his calls untraceable by using two non-functioning phones. In doing so, he faced several years in a federal prison. Before we get to a tragic shooting that started out as a dispute over Call of Duty, let's see what measures may be taken against SWATting. There's been an ongoing debate on whether cybersecurity laws need to be tougher on SWATting. As of the making of this video, SWATting in the US can be prosecuted through federal criminal statutes, such as conspiracy to obstruct justice, conspiracy to commit device fraud, or conspiracy to retaliate against a victim, witness, or informant. The act in and of itself is not considered a federal crime. Callers in the state of California are made to bear the cost of the intervention, which can be up to $10,000. The Seattle Police Department allows people such as celebrities or live streamers to register in case they fear becoming victims. They can give the SPD cautionary information to help them with potential swatting attempts. Police departments are also advised to take caution when responding to calls received through text-to-speech services or at their non-emergency numbers. These may be attempts by swatters who live outside the area and can't connect to the regional 911 center. Number 1. Tyler Barris While living as a homeless man in Los Angeles, California, Tyler Barris was asked by Casey Viner to swat a man called Shane Gayskill. The two had been feuding over Call of Duty WW2 and a $1.50 wager. Viner threatened to SWAT Gayskill, to which he responded that he'd be waiting and gave him his former address in Wichita. Barris, known online as Swartistic, had a criminal record for numerous bomb threats, domestic violence and fraud. He called 911 claiming that a suspect had killed his father, was holding his mother and brother hostage and had been threatening to set the house on fire. He gave the address that Gaskill had falsely claimed to be living at. Wichita PD officers, who weren't trained for tactical or hostage rescues, took the call. They surrounded the house and, before they could announce their presence, 28-year-old Andrew Finch opened the front door. An officer fired a single round from a Colt AR-15 rifle. Finch was shot through the heart and lung and he was later pronounced dead. The officer had reportedly reacted to Finch making a motion with his hand. It's worth mentioning that he wasn't the intended swatted target and hadn't even played Call of Duty. In the aftermath, Barris was sentenced to 20 years in a federal prison. Thanks for watching. Be sure to click on one of the links on your screen for more videos.